Professor Dimitri, Harvard. Welcome. Thank you. Uh, to eCancer TV at ASCO. Uh, you have been very busy over the last couple of days, and I don't suppose that it's going to get any easier today. Um, thank you very much for, for giving us a couple of minutes. Thanks for inviting so, me. So what have you been picking up in the, uh, in the, in the corridors? What's, uh, what's really interesting? You know, this is an incredible year that's forming the foundation for the next level of advances, I would say. We've, we've come to ASCO expecting by now terrific data in certain areas. And we realize that we're going to be starting to nip off cancer as a problem every 5,000 patient group at a time yeah. in the world, not in a country. So this year's big news, of course, I think was all about the ALK mutations in non-small cell lung cancer, something that was just discovered about three years ago and has now been already translated into a very exciting uh, therapy, a potential therapy with extraordinary activity in non-small cell in lung cancer one. in phase one and also in a certain type of sarcoma. I would also say that uh, as someone who really believes that the rare diseases will point the way for the common diseases, there is this rare form of sarcoma known as inflammatory myofibroblastic tumor where the young people, typically aged less than 25, will have the same ALK oh. problem. And they've already had extraordinary responses in the phase one study. So what wasn't discussed much is that just like in the early days of imatinib, where we then did a basket study where anybody where the relevant imatinib targets like PDGF receptor or KIT could go into a study even if they did not have CML or GIST, we're going to do something very similar with ALK because there may be other diseases where ALK is dysregulated, and certainly we know it is in this form of sarcoma. So the Gleevec story keeps repeating itself, one other type of kinase inhibitor at a time just like with sunitinib. Why would the same drug hit renal cell cancer and GIST, two different targets? Sunitinib was also a very big disappointment in the breast cancer world because it really is not something that met its targets for a successful breast cancer therapy. Now yeah, that's a couple of combination studies which are... A couple of combination studies which were negative. But that's important because it also shows it's not as simple. We really need targets that are tolerable and we really need to be smart about the way we design our studies. I think some of the most exciting thing that came out were some of the combinations we're starting to see. Jose Bazelga's group in Barcelona did a spectacular presentation on the combination of an mTOR inhibitor with the IGF-1 receptor inhibitor. Simply a tolerance study at this point, but looking for early clues, and there's lots of reasons to think we might know who those patients are. Our group is presenting another one, same combination, different companies' drugs. And uh, MD Anderson and the NCI did yet another study, same targets. And of course, you're getting Baselga into the bargain uh, in Boston. We are. I apologize <laughs> to the country of Spain <laughs> because we're importing sure. him back again, but uh, we're excited to work together here tonight. Yeah, fantastic. Uh, what, are you, what else are you doing at home, Harvard? So we're uh, testing still the HSP90 pathway. We've mm -hmm. got all sorts of new and intriguing new kinase inhibitors coming down the pike. And uh, fundamentally, what we're doing is profiling our cancers. We're very interested in terms of saying all lung cancers are not alike, even all GISTs are not alike. You take a micro disease like GIST, and we know it's already 50 different diseases. So now our ovarian cancer group, our lung cancer group, our breast cancer group are doing something very, very similar. And the sarcomas? And the sarcomas are big, clearly uh, 7,000 different yours. diseases, exactly. Mm -hmm. And so well, we Where's that all going, you think? That's going into smaller and smaller patient groups. Right. So the, how, how, uh, many, how many active? Uh, drugs are in there, do you think? Oh, at this point in our clinical trials, mm -hmm. we're running at least 30 clinical trials for different smaller and smaller groups of patients, even besides mm -hmm. just diseases like pigmented villonodular tenosynovitis, mm -hmm. things that nobody can pronounce. Mm -hmm. But it's, it's very important because sure. before, if you had a sarcoma, it was a sarcoma, it didn't matter. And then you'd have something called hemangiopericytoma, which sounds like a blood vessel tumor, right? Mm -hmm. Maybe it's a malignancy. And actually now it's called solitary fibrous tumor. But this is a disease that's shown spectacular responses to the combination we talked about before, the IGF-1 receptor and the mTOR inhibitor. Okay. And we're still hoping that the IGF-1 receptor antagonists will work better than they've shown so far in Ewing sarcomas. There will be two presentations now showing that the data when you don't select the right Ewing's patients is not very good. There are certain patients who get extraordinary results, but for the population as a whole, it's probably not good. So that's Jafitinib all over again. It's, it's a lot of that, although with Jafitinib, at least we finally figured out what the mutation was. Yeah. This does not seem to be mutationally driven with the Ewing sarcomas. So what is it? Is it epigenetic? It's the next level of technology so that we can tease apart the different patient groups. In some ways, it's the ipilimumab 
uh, nobody can pronounce that drug. It's the, uh, you know, that, the melanoma, the melanoma drug that prolongs survival. The, the non-anti-melanoma antibody. Exactly, the because what, -T -cell what we all want to know is, right, what are the biomarkers for the people who are going to get the real activity, and can we sec segregate or separate the activity from the immune toxicities? Mm -hmm. I think that's a very important uh, finding, obviously, um, and now it's up to us to apply it to other cancers. It will probably have relevance in sarcomas. It will certainly have relevance in other carcinomas, we're all hoping. George, thank you very much indeed.